amen. Please be, please be seated, everybody. Thank you again, Mikey Lizelle, for leading. Always enjoyed some. You can give them a hand if you like. Give us some encouragement, everybody. And at the kids, you can go to uh, children's worship. And the rest of you have to stay. Sorry. Again, everybody, it's good to have you all here today. Um, I like to start this morning with a phrase, a phrase that maybe you all know very, very well, or maybe it's a lesson, a phrase that we learn a lesson from, a, a very valuable lesson. And you probably most likely learned it when you were young. And the phrase is this. The phrase is this. There you go. Don't make a promise you can't keep. Have you been told that or you've told your kids? Okay, you raised your hand. Yeah, don't make a promise that you can't keep. Again, I think something uh, that we've all heard um, sometime in our life. Have I ever told you guys that? Don't make a promise you can't keep. Okay, good. I, I told them that, <laughs> right? I'm talking to my kids, by the way. I think, everyone, that this is a very important lesson to live by because when we make a promise to someone, it gives them a sense of hope that whatever was promised will be fulfilled. Does that make sense? Right? It's kind of lengthy, but I think I got the gist of it, right? You're giving someone hope that whatever you promise, well, they're definitely going to fulfill it. And that sense of hope may be a variety of different things. It might provide comfort, encouragement, or maybe strength. And making promises, everyone, is easy to do. How many of you tend to make a lot of promises? You just kind of fight. Oh, okay. <laughs> All right, we got one person. All right. You know, it's very easy to do. I, I find myself, you know, probably doing that too. You know, we're making, oh, yeah, I could do that for you. Sure, no problem. I promise. I'll, I'll get it done. And, and we hear that a lot. And that's kind of nice to hear when people say that. However, it could also cause a bit of a problem sometimes, Right? Because in actuality, most promises, everyone, when we make promises, we tend to be very hasty with it, right? We're just trying to make someone feel good for the moment. But in actuality, you got to fulfill it, right? Because you did what? You made a promise, right? You've put all this hope in someone saying, oh, they're going to do it. They said they would. Now I'm going to wait for it. But most promises, however, tend to be very unkept, right? They're unkept. They're, people don't keep their promises, and they're unfulfilled, resulting in the people that you made a promise to, to do what? They lose trust in you, okay? They lose trust in you. I, I think that's very natural, a natural reaction to that. And I've also heard it said that the type of character of a person can be discovered if they fulfill promises that they have made. I, does that make sense? I think it makes a lot of sense. You can judge a person's character to some degree about the promises they will fulfill. Because why a person that fulfills their promises are trustworthy and they have a lot of integrity. I mean, that's a couple you know, examples I can give you. While a person that doesn't fulfill their promises, well, most likely they cannot be trusted and they can be seen as dishonest and as a liar. Right? I, I think, and I think that's very fair. And again, I, I tend not to want to use politics a lot, but man, it's a, it's a political year right now. It's kind of crazy, right? As this is an election year, one of the tactics of political parties that they do to one another is to do what? Slander the other ca candidate and their character, right? If we can slander the character of the candidates, we have a better chance at winning here or, or getting their votes to vote for us. And, and much of which is, of what they do is based upon the person's track record of fulfilling promises they have made in the past. That's what they often do, right? Like so-and-so said they were going to promise to not to raise taxes, but <gasps> they raised what? They raised the taxes. So they're what? They're a liar. You can't trust them. So this is a tactic that has been going on and on, uh, in, at least in politics for, gosh, as long as I think I've known it. We see it every four years, right? Or every whatever years for voting, whatever positions in, in the nation. If we can prove that opposing candidate has lied, then voters could be convinced that their candidate, again, is not trustworthy. And as a result, you should not put your hope in their promises. Do not put their hope in their promises because they're not going to fulfill it. Again, a, a very old tactic used for actually centuries not just in government, but in, in any situation. 
You know, even in our study of Second Peter, everyone, the false teachers at that time were using a very similar tactic against the believers of the churches in Asia Minor. And they wanted to convince these believers not to place their hope in the promise of Christ's return, right? That was a really, really big thing. If we can convince, these false teachers convince these believers in these churches that Jesus is not going to return, we've got them, right? Because if Jesus doesn't return, Jesus is what? A liar, not trustworthy. And so if you're not going to trust Jesus, who should you trust? Trust us. That was their tactic. So because remember, everyone, in, in these early churches had experienced hardships. They had been persecuted, and they were scattered for their faith. They had been taught that they, could, that they would only have to suffer for a little while. That's what a lot of these letters that, that, that Paul and Peter wrote to these churches. You're only going to have to suffer for a little while, because why? Jesus is going to come back. That's the hope that you need to hang on to. And again, they were able to endure because of that promised hope that, yes, Christ is coming back. He is coming back for us. But again, it was the goal of the false teachers to convince that these believers, he's not coming back. That Jesus, again, was not going to keep his promises. He's not going to return. It was Peter's goal, however, to encourage that Jesus was indeed coming back for them one day. And these, this is the same promise for us, too. Amen? Right? Jesus is coming back one day. So we're going to take a look today at our passage, 2 Peter chapter 3, verses 1-10. through 10. If you have your Bibles, I went off on you guys a couple of weeks ago. Do you have your Bibles with you? Ah, I just want you to hold them up, please. No, you don't have them. Okay. Do you have your Bibles on your phones? You can hold those up. Okay. Enough said. All right. Please try to bring your Bibles. All right. That's my challenge to you. We're going to be looking at 2 Peter chapter 3, verses 1-10, through 10, where Peter provides insight as to this promised hope of Christ's return and what that should mean to us. So you guys ready? All right? All right, so let's just jump into this right now with our first insight that I believe Peter gives us. And that first insight is this, that believers need to be reminded of God's promised hope. Okay, it sounds silly, but this is the first thing that jumps out here, that believers, you and I, need to be reminded of God's promised hope. It says here in verses 1 through 2, it says, Dear friends, Peter writes, this is now my second letter to you, hence why it's called Second Peter, right? I have written both of them as reminders to stimulate you to wholesome thinking. I want you to recall the words spoken in the past by the holy prophets and the command given by our Lord and Savior through your apostles. You know, Peter's concern for these early believers was that they had begun to doubt in the promised hope of God. I think that's what was going on. They started to doubt in this promised hope of God that Jesus was going to return. Why? Again, because living under the strain of persecution, can you imagine being under that much persecution and, and waiting on Jesus to come back? That's, that's a lot to handle, right? And on top of that, they're being influenced by these false teachers that were in the church telling them otherwise, right? Right? So these believers were at high risk in doubting in God's promised hope of Jesus' return and that he was actually going to deliver them from this earthly life. He wanted them, Peter wanted, to remember, wanted them to remember that of the Old Testament prophecies that were foretold and the testimonies of the apostles' teachings of Jesus that yes, he indeed will come back and the promise will be fulfilled. And it's no difference for us, everyone, right? When you really think about it, with so much pressure and stress in life, we can also begin to doubt that things will ever get better, right? Sometimes that happens with us. Is this ever going to get better? Lord, I'm waiting, I'm waiting, I'm waiting, but nothing's happening. So sometimes we'll, we want to give up. And, and I've said this before so many times, and I know you think this too, particularly with 2020, the way things are going so far for many of us, I wouldn't mind if Jesus came back tomorrow, right? I wish he would come back tomorrow. Not today because Cardinals are playing. No, I'm just kidding. That's a bad joke. <laughs> that just came off. I don't know why. All right. It's the football jerseys, I think, that are throwing me off here right now that you are wearing. So, right, come back because it's so hard. On all this stuff, all this mess, we don't have to worry about it anymore. Yet we too, everyone, 
we must be reminded of the Old Testament prophecies. All the prophecies we've heard that Scripture has told us, and also the New Testament teachings of this promised hope that Jesus, again, one day will come. Don't lose hope, everyone, right? Don't lose hope. But there will be many out there that will tell you otherwise. They'll tell you, no, lose hope. Lose hope, and they will mock and scoff at the idea that there is a Savior coming back to deliver us from this, this life. That leads us, everyone, to our second insight that I think Peter gives us here as we keep walking through this chapter. That false teachers will scoff at the promised hope of Christ's return. They will scoff at the promised hope of Christ's return. Look what it says here, <clears throat> verses 3 through 6. Above all, you must understand that in the last days, scoffers will come. Scoffing, and that's what scoffers do, right? Scoffing and following their own evil desires. They will say, where is this coming that he promised? Ever since our ancestors died, everything goes on as it did since the beginning of creation. But they deliberately forget that long ago by God's word, the heavens came into being and the earth was formed out of water and by water. By these waters also the world of that time was deluged and destroyed. Talking about the great flood of Noah, right? By the same word, the present heavens and earth are reserved for fire, being kept for the day of judgment, which is yet to come, and destruction of the ungodly. There's a lot of stuff in there, right? And I'll try to unpack it as best as I can. These false teachers, everyone, had mocked these believers in believing again that Jesus was coming back for them, right? Peter called them scoffers. That's not a word we use very much, right? Scoffing, okay? Scoffing is, um, is, um, is something that I think people have scoffed at me before. I'm pretty sure they have, all right? And maybe to you too. Well, scoffing is like this. I'll give you an example because when I read, what, I thought, what's scoffing like? My example, well, this popped into my head. I remember when years ago when the Lord was calling me to go into, into full-time ministry, I was at a men's Bible study. This has to be over 20-something years ago, right? And, and within the men were different people I knew, some I actually grew up with because they moved up here from Tucson. And one of my high school friends that I've known for forever from my old church, I said, I, you know what, I think God's calling me to full-time ministry. And you know what he did? And it's always the ones that didn't know you, that know you the best. They go, he goes, you, a pastor? Huh. You know, and he just, and then he rolled his eyeballs at me. That's scoffing. <laughs> All right? He totally mocked me in front of everybody. And I'll tell you, that really stung. That's why that came up to, in my mind when I thought about scoffing, because it hurt a lot when someone scoffs at you. Right? That's what these false teachers were doing to these believers in this church. These false teachers scoffed at their belief. Right? And, and, and then even as it's written here, you know, and you've got you know, you to listen to how it's probably being said. He says in verse 4 again, where is this coming? Come on. Huh. Rolling eyeballs, right? He's not coming back. This promise, huh. he's, you think that's a promise? He's not going to fulfill his promise. Never. That's scoffing, right? You fool for believing in such things, right? It is believed that these false teachers at the time in these churches were called Gnostics. Okay, Gnostics. And, and they were, I'll give you a simple version of them. They were a very heretical movement that, that skewed Christianity to fill their own selfish and sinful purposes. And one of their beliefs, everyone, basically said this. It's okay to sin. It's okay to sin. Don't worry. And the reason why? Because they didn't believe that there would be no judgment from God. Hey, why not? God's not going to judge me for it. I'm going to do whatever I want. Doesn't that sound pretty appealing than enduring strife and persecution and waiting on God to deliver you? Which one would you choose? Well, some of them would choose not. I'd rather indulge in my own lifestyle. They completely ignored the fact, however, and it says it in this passage, that no, there was judgment. Hey, don't you remember the great flood? <laughs> that was judgment. Okay, they, they should have known this. And by the way, there will also be a future judgment as well. But they totally ignored it. Just trying to sell that, no, go ahead, indulge in your own pleasures and desires. Because why? Nothing ever is going to change. That's what they said in this passage, right? Even from the beginning, our answer is once it was created, ah, God's not involved. Do whatever you want. That's a lie, everybody, right? 
So if someone's telling you that, it's a complete lie. But I can see, everyone, why people, why false teachers, or just people in general, mock us and scoff at us for what we believe. I can see why, right? Again, this topic, this promised hope of Christ's return, right? You know, Christians have been saying that, God, that Christ will be coming back for thousands of years. And they always say, Christ is coming back soon. But it's been over 2,000 years. I don't know about you, but soon is not 2,000 years. <laughs> that doesn't equate. That's like saying, oh, hold your breath for a little while, and it's 2,000 years. <laughs> it, it doesn't compute. So, of course, people will mock us for that. But let's read how Peter addresses this in our next set of verses. And our, second, our third insight, that the promised hope of Christ's return is based upon God's sovereign timing. God's sovereign timing, which means what? Not in our timing. That makes sense, right? It says this, verse 8. But do not forget this one thing, dear friends, with the Lord, a day is like a thousand years, and a thousand years are like a day. The Lord is not slow in keeping his promises, as some understand slowness. Instead, he is patient with you, not wanting anyone to perish, but everyone to come to repentance. Whoa, right? A thousand years is a day, a day is a thousand years to God. That's like, right? Mind blowing. That's a discussion you talk in, in a philosophy class, right? It's hard to grasp because why? It doesn't logically make sense. It doesn't make sense. But we have to understand something about God, everyone, that God is not bound by natural law. He's not bound by natural law. He created natural law, but he's not bound by natural law. He is outside of time and outside of space. And just because we don't agree with God's timing doesn't mean he's not acting. Just because we disagree with God's time doesn't mean he's not acting. And he says it here, and it's so spectacular, I think, that we really need to pay attention to verse 9. Okay? He said, the Lord is not slow in keeping his promises. He didn't say he doesn't keep his promises. He just says, it's not going according to your time. Right? But he says, understand this, everyone. Instead, he says, he is patient with you, not wanting anyone to perish, but everyone to come to repentance. See, we have to understand something very, very important. God's delay in Christ's return, should, again, should not be seen as an unfulfilled promise, but rather his patience and his mercy. Why? Because the way I read it, he's not coming back yet. Why? Because he wants more people to be saved. I think that's pretty amazing, don't you? See, for us as Christians, we're going, come back, come back, come back, come back. What's taking you so long? But God said, I'm not ready to come back. Why? Because I need more people to be saved. So that's a little selfish on our behalf, isn't it? Because I want more people, well, to be saved. Do you, um, do you remember taking road trips with your families? Right? Some of you may still do that or not. And I remember when I was young, we would take these... Um, his road trips to Los Angeles from Tucson. And that's a good seven hours. And back in those days, this is probably back in the, gosh, the 70s, right? And, you know, we had this long old Chevy. I can't remember what it was, Caprice, I think that's what we had. Do you guys remember, you old people? Do you remember the Chevy Caprice? It's like driving a boat, you know, it's like, you know, you're doing this. And, and of course, they would just throw, the, you know, I have two older sisters and throw us in the back. And it was boring. Seven hours in a car driving from Tucson to Los Angeles. There's not even anything to look at, right? It's just all desert. Boom. Okay? And back in those days, we didn't have mobile phones. We had nothing to entertain ourselves. So you, got, you had to be creative. But of course, as, as, as kids are, we get very, very restless. And we ask the most dangerous question to the driver, which is always the father. What do we say? Yeah, I'll accept all of the above there, okay? What I wrote was this. How much longer? How much longer? And, and you know, I'm sure you dads out there have been asked this too by your impatient kids. How much longer? You know, I had to do it more with a whiny voice, right? And that used to just set my dad off, right? He would get so angry at us because we probably asked it numerous times every mile on the, you know, are we there yet? Are we there yet? Are we there yet? And he would say, be quiet. 
And she says, we will get there. There you go. We will get there when we get there. And he would tell us, just keep busy. It was, it's difficult, right, to ask any kids to be patient because seven hours might as well be what? A whole year. Seven hours is actually a whole year. But we found a way to pass the time, and eventually we arrived just as my father said we would arrive. We will get there when we get there. Everyone, this is also true when waiting upon the return of Christ. We might complain how much longer, how much longer until Christ returns. But God, our Father in heaven, is instead telling us this, okay? He will get there when he gets there, right? He will get there when he gets there. And with the time that we have waiting, I think God is saying, what are you going to do with it? Right? What are you going to do with that time while you're waiting until he comes by, back? What are you going to do with it? And in that time, I believe, ought to be sharing our faith and hope with the lost and helping them to lead them towards a relationship with Jesus Christ. Amen? Right? Because, again, what did it say here? He wants more people to come to repentance. Don't you think we're part of that plan? I think you know we're part of that plan. Okay? In some ways, we share with some urgency. We share the gospel with some urgency because why? We don't know when Jesus will return because he'll come when he comes. He'll get here when he gets here. And that leads us to our last insight in verse 10, that Christ's promised return will be sudden and unexpected. That's why there's a sense of urgency because it's sudden and it's unexpected. Look what he says here, and this is a very famous verse. It says, but the day of the Lord will come like a thief. The heavens will disappear with a roar. The elements will be destroyed by fire and the earth and everything done in it will be laid bare. To put simply, everyone, the day of the Lord is when Jesus will return. And it will involve other events. You've heard these terms before, like the rapture, tribulation, and final judgment. And everyone, this is like, woo, end time stuff, man. And we don't have a lot of time to go over the end time stuff in this sermon, all right? But it's something that we do need to learn about. But I need to tell you this. Actually, there tends to be a lot of debate, actually, as the exact order of events, right? Theologians have disagreed and argued over this stuff all the time and what position you hold, pre-trip, mid-trip, pre-trip, what post-trip, whatever trip, okay, when Jesus is actually coming back. It, it's a crazy argument. But in my opinion, everyone, it really doesn't matter. It doesn't matter, and why? Because he'll get here when he gets here. It doesn't matter who was right or wrong. When he comes, he comes. So why are we arguing over all these kind of things? Because Peter's point is this. Again, Christ's return will be sudden and it'll be unexpected. And as much as there are scoffers mocking that Jesus is not going to return or believers impatiently waiting for Christ's return, again, it'll happen in a moment's notice without warning. He describes it as a thief. And there was this incredible movie, again, if you're my age, back in the 70s, a movie called A Thief in the Night. Do you remember that one? Who's watched that? None of you? Am I the only one? Okay, we have one person there. You kind of seen it? Okay, and you're younger, so you've seen it. That's a good movie. I think it was made in 1972. But it was one of the first movies that were ever made about the end times. Okay? And there is this scene, and I, I'll tell you, I've seen a lot of horror movies in my life, and I'm not equating this as a horror movie. But in terms of being scared, this one scared me. Because this is, this is end times. This is Bible stuff, man. And there was a scene when a young man woke up to find that many people were missing, especially in his family. And why? They're missing because all the believers had been raptured and taken up, and he was left behind. That's pretty scary. You know, and maybe you've seen the other Left Behind series. I think it was Kirk Cameron. Is that who it is, right? And it talks about the same stuff, the end times. They, he was left behind. And this is why everyone, Jesus has yet to return, because why he doesn't want people to be left behind. And he has placed that burden on our hearts as believers to lead others to Christ before what? It's too late. Before it's too late. Everyone, I'm not trying to scare you. Okay, I'm not trying to scare you. But this is the reality of what will happen according to the prophecies of Scripture and what was taught by Jesus and the disciples of the promise hope yet to come. 
You know, there's this great gospel song, and I'm not going to sing it. I'm just going to read it, okay? Unless, unless Lizelle, you want to sing this portion with me. <laughs> Maybe you know it, okay? The chorus goes this, will you be ready when Jesus comes, okay? Sounds so much better than the gospel. Oh, I'm saying it. Okay, I'm not going to sing it. I'm not going to sing it, okay? Will you be ready when Jesus comes? For when Jesus comes, he will raise the church and judge us for what we have done for him. Right? We know this. Will you be ready for that? Will you be ready when Jesus comes at a moment's notice, unexpected and sudden, and he's going to judge you and say, what have you done? Right? This is why it's so important that Christians are living holy and righteous lives, serving one another in love and good deeds, and sharing our faith. And we've got to keep on doing that. Why? Because we don't know when Jesus is coming. But we're going to be judged for it when it happens. Will you, everyone, be ready when Jesus comes? Will we be ready for the promised hope of Christ's return? Amen? Amen. Let's pray. Father God, we thank you, Lord, for this time as we continue to look at 2 Peter. And this is a very powerful, um, very powerful letter in which we read, Lord, because it tells us, Lord, that of your promises. And you are always good to keep your promises, Lord. You never change, Father. What you say will happen. And Father, as we wait for the return of Christ, Lord, we are to, to ignore those scoffers and those mockers that think we're fools, but to stay steadfast, Father, in being obedient to you. Because we don't know when you are sending your son back to claim us, Father. And with that, Lord, we need to be prepared. Are we ready when Jesus comes? Are we ready? Have we lived a life that is righteous, that is serving you, that is loving others? Father, that's what we need to be doing. That's what you commanded us to do until you return. So, Father, I lift up everyone here, Lord. May they be challenged by this message, that will they be ready for the guaranteed promised hope of your son's return? In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. to see.